I've done so many program reviews over the years, I figured that it was time I review one of my programs. We're coming up on two years since I released Base Strength, and in that I had 10 prefabricated programs, uh, one of which really stood out to me, and that was the Bull Mastiff program, that I actually made kind of the focal point of the follow-up book, Peak Strength. Now, I had never actually intended that everybody run through each program exactly as it was written, but I knew that that was probably what was going to happen. The books dealt with the foundational principles of training and programming and the concepts of how to structure training and how to evaluate yourself and put together something that does a good job of balancing stress and recovery. And I wanted to flesh that out, showing all of the different ways based on different splits and frequencies and exercise selections that you could put that together. So they were, and I still see them as being examples more than anything. This isn't one of those things where, well, you're not doing my program if you tweak it. It is meant to be tweaked. It is meant to be molded because you are never not on the hook for changing your approach to get the right answer. It is always up to you to put something into practice, take notes on what you think worked and what didn't, adjust and move forward until you get the, the desired outcome. So I wanted to break down Bull Mastiff because it seems to have gotten some special attention. A lot of people have ran it. It seems to have gotten very good feedback. And I wanted to break down the structure. I wanted to discuss uh, why I think it's working so well for so many people and what some of the potential pitfalls are. Maybe why some things don't work as well or when you might be justified in making some changes to it, depending on the type of lifter you are. So we're gonna get into the mechanics. We're gonna get into the exercise selection. I'm gonna break down the progression of it. And we're actually gonna go over some uh, Reddit reviews from some of the feedback I've gotten from the people on the R Weight Room subreddit. And I actually decided to take the chapter that breaks down Bull Mastiff in its entirety in peak strength. I took 13 pages that break down the exercises, the progressions, a good detail breakdown. I think peak strength is on the order, a little under 200 pages. Uh, so this is 13 pages of that book, absolutely free. Just go ahead and click on the link below. The only thing I ask for in return is your email, which I'm going to use to bother you every time I put out a new book, a new program, have a new special on training, or if I just have some good training wisdom I want to share with you for the day. So go ahead and check that out below. So getting into the program, let's start off with a review. This is one of the better reviews. This is this got me excited. Hopefully it gets you excited too. So this starts off user Highlander Ajax. Brief summary, unbelievably good progress beyond what I had dared hope for. That's promising. The first time I saw that, I lit up. It's always cool when somebody applies something you put out and get a very good result. This specific individual, his squat went from 395 for a single to 415 for seven. That is on the order of a 100 pound increase on the squat. That is huge. Bench 295 for a single to 345 for seven. That's even bigger than the squat jump. Deadlift 535 for a single to 545 for seven and his press 215 for a single to 235 for six. Now, a couple of things about this individual. One, they talked about how uh, with the COVID shutdowns, they hadn't been training. So the numbers they started with were low. You're always going to have a much easier time rediscovering uh, old strength that you've gained. If it takes you 10 years to get to a 500 pound deadlift, you can let yourself completely atrophy all the way to where you can't pick up 315 off the ground. Once you start eating and training right, you, you'll get back to that 500 pound deadlift within a couple of months. And that's something I've experienced many times with injuries and setbacks and layoffs. Um, so that is part of the equation. There's also a bigger lifter. He says at the bottom, he's sitting at about 250 pounds. I called this program Bull Massive for a reason. This is not for hard gainers who want to stay at 160 pounds. This is not for people who are really focused on staying in a, a low weight class. The driving force of this program is volume, is work, is a total number of hard hitting exercises. And the implication of that is that by doing it and adapting to the volume and eating, you're going to grow mass and that mass is going to make you much, much stronger. I actually took the progression from Doug Young who is like a 70s lifting icon because he was so big and built and muscular and he did what we now call power building. It was very much strength work on the main lifts and then a ton of volume work on smaller lifts. He had a famous quote that said, anybody who says they want to be strong without looking the part, he doesn't think they're telling the whole truth. On a Monday, I will train strictly powerlifting for nothing but strength. 
and on Wednesday I will train for what other people would consider for physique. I mean, I definitely would not want to be very, very strong and not look very strong. I'd want to look just as strong as I am. And to the people that say it's not important, I would consider they are not really telling the whole truth. So I actually took inspiration from him for, for this. This is definitely something where you are going to fill out your frame. Doesn't mean you have to get fat. You're not going to wake up tomorrow, look like Kiriakos Grizzly, but a good five to 10 pound body weight increase. If you're 170 going to 175, 180, that's, that's not huge, but the returns will be absolutely huge. So this is also an outlier. I don't want you to get your hopes up that this is actually uh, what you're going to expect as kind of a default return. I'm not selling this as something that, uh, hey, run Bull Mastiff and you're going to put 100 pounds on all your lifts in 12 weeks. This guy's an outlier, but I did get excited when reading this to see that there were people that had such good results, especially on the bench press. And I'm going to get into that later because that's a point of uh, some criticism that I want to address uh, because some people have cited that their uh, their bench progress hasn't been that good on it at least compared to the squatting and deadlifting. And I want to get into why I think that is uh, and what things you can do to kind of work around that depending on you and your individual circumstances. So getting into the mechanics of the program, it is a low frequency program. It is a one lift per day uh, split. I did last week the video on uh, training splits for strength and I compared everything from whole body to push pull legs to one lift per day. This is a very popular, very commonly seen kind of pop programming approach. It allows even distribution. It allows you to work very, very hard on those workouts so you don't have to worry about walking a tightrope of recovery and you don't, don't have to obsess over RPE or exactly how hard the effort is. You go hard on that one day, everything surrounds that one particular exercise, and then you get seven days to recover. And the fact that you're giving equal attention to the bench press, the overhead, the deadlift, and the squat, it lends itself to a very uh, well-rounded uh, type of development. So it definitely has its benefits. That doesn't mean that it's all benefit, and we'll talk about that. Uh, so it allows a lot of recovery, but it requires high volume and effort. So if you're not likely to go very hard, if you have a, a predisposition to uh, getting bored halfway through the workout or skipping out on the last few exercises, this isn't going to be up your alley unless you, you want to practice some personal growth and figure out how to actually commit to staying around and doing all of the work. It requires high volume and high effort. So the mechanic of this program, it is high volume and high effort. Main lift requires some max volume followed by an AMRAP. That's the main lift progression. Uh, this is akin to what you see with something like the Grayskull LP. Anybody who's trained under me knows that I love the plus set approach with sub maximal volume. So it's like three by five or five by five with a relatively light weight, last set to an AMRAP. And what that does is it gives you very uh, easy to recover from volume. So you get a lot of good technical touches. It's still a substantial amount of work, but it ensures that the volume you're getting is not pushed to the limit, that you're not falling apart, you're not accruing a bunch of fatigue. It is token volume that stacks up from set to set. And it primes you for the last set, which is an AMRAP, because you're actually going to do better on the AMRAP having done all of those easy sets before. And the AMRAP provides the effort, the intensity, the training stress, and it gives you a carrot to chase. The variation and accessory work volumizes. And this is something that I've talked about a lot. This is, this is one of my favorite approaches. And for the people it works for, it works exceptionally well. The volumizing approach is simply adding sets each week as the main driver of progress. So instead of focusing on progressive overload by increasing load and subjecting yourself to more and more weight, which everybody will do too much of or they'll jump too fast and they end up hitting a brick wall. And when you have no room to improve, it's like, okay, what do I do now if I'm already at the, the heaviest amount of weight I can handle and I'm not getting stronger? This forces you to stay back, to do the double digit reps, with these really good developmental exercises to get that good hypertrophy volume. And it forces you to adapt to increasing amounts of volume. So if I tell somebody to do, let's say five sets of 10, and that's just what you do because that's some optimal amount of work that's going to grow you, they're going to be very inclined, uh, many people anyways, will be very inclined to uh, slack off on the work, to not finish it. Uh, it's very common for people to skip the exercise at the end. However, if I tell somebody 
that the main method of progression is adding sets, they're going to be focused on that. They're going to be more likely to do the sets because that is the driving mode of progression. And because of that, they're going to end up doing work that they very likely would not have done otherwise. So in as much as you can write a program that works for a big group of people, the more people it works for, the more universal it is, the more broad the principles have to be. And I think that's, it hits that note with general training culture, especially in strength sports where a lot of people are, and I've beat this drum before, they're too specialized. They're not doing enough volume. They're not committing to a lot of sets with a lot of reps. Everything is just singles, doubles, and triples with their favorite barbell exercises and variations. And by solving that problem, by getting people out of that box, we've seen some really monumental growth from this. And I really think that's why this has worked so well for the people it has. Um, it's also a medium amount of uh, variability as far as exercise selection goes. So it's a, it's a less variation than something like the conjugate method, which is going to have you rotate to exotic variations on a regular basis. But it's more varied than something like a very a simplistic foundational barbell approach that's high frequency. Like think of the Texas method or think of some very specialized powerlifting programs where most of your training is some squat bench dead every day. We are doing bodybuilding stuff, isolation stuff, machines if they're available to you. Uh, and we are every week, the second workout for whatever lift is going to have a variation. So there is a good amount of variation. So it walks this line between giving you enough skill work by having the main movement done for a good amount of volume every single week, but also with enough variation to target weaknesses to develop you in a, in a well-rounded way. So I think that is definitely an asset, especially since this program is being kind of given out to a wide variety of people. It's also auto-regulated. So AMRAPs by themselves, remember the main progression, last set is done as many reps as you can. The first workout, it's gonna be like 14 or 15 reps. That by itself is auto-regulated because let's say I tell you to do a top three at an RP8. A lot of people might get a complex over RP. They're like, oh my God, did I have five more pounds? Was that an RP8? Was it a seven and a half? Uh, people will often dramatically undershoot and they don't get enough of a training stress to really cause growth or they'll dramatically overshoot and then they'll go right up against that brick wall right out of the gate, which is also a problem. This type of auto-regulation, it gives you a weight you know you can do and it tells you to do as many as you can. So most people don't have a problem getting to that last good set. Anybody can get under a barbell and fail or stop a rep before failure. So that's kind of a nice tactic, again, for prescribing work for a wide population of people. But also the approach that's used in determining your weight jump the following week is to take that AMRAP number and the number of reps that you got over the base number of reps. So let's say it's uh, sets of five and on the last set you get 14. You did nine more reps. So for every extra rep you get, you take 1% of what your one rep max is. And for every rep, you add 1%. So let's say it's 300 pounds, 1% is three pounds. If you did nine extra reps, nine times three, 27, you add 27 pounds. And what that does is it aggressively moves you up to weights that are more appropriate for that rep range. So it's only the first week where things are very light. You're getting your toe in the water, you're getting good technical work, you're getting a lot of volume. And you do a bunch of reps, which it provides a, itself a good training stress if you're not used to it. The next week, you're going to be in a more strength-specific range. And the week after that, you're really going to be up against the limit where you might not even get any extra reps on that last set. And what this does is it follows a timeline. This is periodization and practice. This is what separates periodization from something like a linear progression or forever program. We are using the structure of training to... Uh, exploit these really hard workouts while making them sustainable. So we're exploiting the fact that going really, really hard, having a really heavy week is really good for growth. But also if we do that every week, we're going to hit a wall. We're going to have a problem. So by ebbing and flowing, having scheduled heavy weeks, kind of medium weeks, kind of light weeks, by ebbing and flowing back and forth like that, we have a built-in kind of organic method of preserving recovery. So we still get to go ham. We still get to go hard in certain capacities. We don't have to really keep the throttle back. As long as we're following the percentage and we're following the prescription for weight jumps, it will happen organically. And it just works very well for a lot of people. I have this written out in three week waves. A lot of programs do that. Juggernaut 531 are great examples. And it's 
just that simple first week is kind of easy. Second week, a little more challenging. Third week, you kind of let it fly in anticipation of that reset the following week. And then you can take it one step further as you get more advanced and you understand how you kind of roll forward in uh, progressing during these prog- uh, these programs. You can incorporate things like deload. I have guidelines for novice, intermediate, and advanced. I think advanced lifters, every two to three weeks, they need to deload. Intermediate lifters can get away with it every five, six, seven weeks. So maybe after two waves, an intermediate lifter will deload. And a novice lifter doesn't really need to deload at all. And by applying that methodology, it's really easy to find a good sustainable amount of work that is also substantial enough to cause you to grow. Um, So the basic split very simple, very straightforward. One lift per day, squat day, bench day, deadlift day, overhead press day. It's a blended approach, which means the accessory work is going to be for the opposite lift. So on squat day, you follow up with deadlift variation. On deadlift day, you follow up with squat variation. Similarly for benching and overhead. And then, and there's a lot of ways to schedule the accessory. This is how I like to schedule the accessory. It doesn't matter so much, but generally upper body stuff, specifically pressing work is done on bench and overhead day triceps, I put biceps there, uh, rear delt, rotator cuff. So some of the odds and ends that keep you in one piece. And I decided to put uh, back work on lower body days. Back work goes really good with deadlift work and we're deadlifting twice a week, some variation. And then hamstring and quad work uh, pops up twice a week along with abdominals. So the progression for this, again, it's in three week waves. The first three week wave, four by six plus, I have you starting out at 65%. I adjusted this down from what I put in base strength. And that's just because in a program like this, especially given that you're auto-regulating the jumps each week, I think it is better to start off further back, give yourself more room to improve. So that was just something that was me trying to get in the head of the average person who's going to be running this. Um, Even if you start off too light on week one, weeks two and three will still be substantial. So the, the purpose of the structure is still preserved. Uh, Four sets of six plus. This is Doug Young's program. The method of auto-regulation was made famous by Doug Young. The change I made to it is I have you evolve through different rep ranges and reset to different percentages. So the resets happen like clockwork on a deadline. You go to five by five plus at 70%, starting week seven, six by four plus at 75%. So those follow-up weeks though, you are using that AMRAP performance to determine the jump. So again, weeks two and three, weeks five and six, weeks eight and nine, you are accelerating through and handling heavier and heavier loads that are based directly on what you did the week before. The variation progression, uh, and this is where we start to see volumizing. This is where we are prescribing more work as the driving force of growth, which is why it is such a good hypertrophy program, which is why I named it Bull Massive. What do you think of? You think of a a big meaty dog. I have little rodent dogs. I have like Cocker Spaniel Chihuahua mixes. I have a cattle dog who's a runt. He's probably going to get like 40 pounds. You look at a bull mastiff, 150 pound animal, thick neck, big head. That's kind of, I don't know, maybe I identify with that. That's why I chose it. It's my spirit animal. But the volumizing effect is huge for adding girth, for adding size, your shoulders, your upper back, your midsection, your hips to make you more powerful. Uh, We start week one with three sets of 12, then you go to four sets, then you go to five sets, then you reset at a heavier rep range. Again, letting yourself clear out efforts a little bit lower. And as the volume increases, so does the effort. So it's a really big one-two punch of training stress. Similarly for the isolation and the accessory stuff, I start a little bit lighter. It's a personal preference. You can start at three sets. I'll start at at two, going from two to three to four, and then I will increase that into subsequent weeks. That's a smaller detail. The program doesn't live or die with that. RPE here doesn't matter so much. Uh, Seven to eight is what I count a normal working set. Nines and tens should be exceptional because when you hit a nine or a 10, fatigue accumulates really quickly and you're going to have to drop weight on the next set in order to uh, meet that rep requirement. And that directly lowers volume. So the point here is volume. Effort is still important, but it's not our main priority here. So I recommend seven, eight RPE. And uh, aim to start a little lighter on week one and to increase RPE uh, to the higher end for week three. By week three, it's okay if you miss a rep or two, uh, but try not to make that the norm. Going into some more reviews. These are a little more measured. Uh, This is a a 12-week review of Bull Mastiff. Uh, This guy, 85 kilos. You're looking at about 180 pounds, 21-year-old male. 
um, overhead press went from 80 kilos, so 176 pounds for a single, to 80 kilos by four. So he took his one rep max, we did a four rep max. Now his new max is 90 kilos for one, so that's 198 pounds. Uh, squatting, he went from 190 for a single to 210, so that's a 44 pound increase, 20 kilo jump. Deadlift, 220 uh, for a single to 230, and he says he believes he could have gotten 240 if he didn't squat first. So a good 30 kilos, that's 66 pounds on his total. He's pretty happy with this. Uh, and this is an example. This individual said that he didn't notice his bench was moving very well. So I want to talk about that. I've seen it pop up a couple times in discussions about this program. Uh, typically, 20, 30 pound jumps on squat and deadlift for like a five to 10 pound jump on bench press. And people get really underwhelmed with that. How often you bench press and how many exercises you do is going to be dependent on how you respond to training. So there's a lot of individual variables here that you have to get a handle on. And again, that's why I say these are examples. These are meant to be tweaked. If you ran through Bull Mastiff and you found that the squat and deadlift gains were insane and your bench was underwhelming, you are absolutely justified in making tweaks so that your bench continues to move forward. Some people will notice that keeping their bench work to a main exercise and a variation, a little bit of overhead pressing, and then paying a lot of attention to triceps, upper back, biceps, delts, etc., is going to grow their bench like a weed that historically their problem may have been that they were overreaching, trying to do too much. And when they back off and they just focus on good quality work for that prescription of work, that they grow like a weed. That's what happened with the first guy. 295 for a single to 345 by seven. That puts him over a 400 pound bench. It's like 100, 110 pounds on his bench in a pretty short period of time. That's insane. And that tells you that that person in particular is best suited for this type of frequency, this amount of training stress. It's the right balance of stress and recovery. Most people, and again, I did the video on uh, fast gainers and slow gainers last week, so you can check that out. Uh, most people are going to bias towards slow gainer territory. So especially smaller muscle groups, smaller movements like benching and overhead pressing, they're going to be better off going a little more uh, frequently throughout the week, uh, doing a little more effort, maybe having another exercise in each session. So that's going to be required for people who are, say, on the lighter side. Maybe if you're not committed to gaining weight, uh, if your calorie intake isn't very high, if you're not a very coordinated lifter, you need those touches to build up technical expertise. You might find that you detrain a little bit too fast. So anybody on the slow gainer side is going to benefit from a little bit more work. So my recommendation for those people that experience this would be to include another bench press exercise. Doesn't have to be for nearly as many sets, but another bench press variation uh, on each day. And I would actually recommend that you emphasize one lift or the other. So you pick either bench or overhead. If you pick bench, you double up on uh, another bench exercise. If you pick overhead, you double up on another overhead exercise. Or you experiment with adding a third bench press day. That's viable as well. I wouldn't overcomplicate it. I would just repeat uh, the variation progression for another exercise. So maybe if your main variation was something like a close grip bench, maybe you add one more exercise, now you're doing an incline bench and you use the same set and rep progression to make it pretty easy. That is my recommendation. Remember, it is up to you to figure out how you respond to frequency, how you respond to a total amount of volume, and which dials to turn so that you find that right balance of stress and recovery because it's not going to be the same for everybody. The thing about squatting and deadlifting is they're bigger muscles, more range of motion, bigger dose of training stress with each repetition. So a repetition of benching is not equal to a repetition of squatting. And this is actually a problem when you see a lot of these programs that have this symmetry built into it. And I've talked about this before, that we are inclined to write and follow programs that look clean on paper, that have this kind of balance to them. And it's not for nothing. It's not arbitrary. I mean, it makes it easier to conceptualize what it is that we're doing and to stay engaged. If you have a program that is entirely based off of uh, what you think works and you're not trying to adhere to any type of, of symmetry, you can end up with some jumbled messes that are harder to keep track of. It removes you from the conceptual understanding, from the engagement of what you're doing and why. You're constantly having to go back through your notes, be like, what am I doing today? What did I do last week? Whereas when you have something that follows a very simple, catchy arrangement, it's very easy to keep that present in your head and stay engaged with what you're doing. So it's not for nothing, but this is an example of that. 
Uh, and again, like Juggernaut does the same thing. 531 does the same thing. Other programs have done the same thing where you end up kind of prescribing the same amount of work for squatting, deadlifting as you do benching and overhead, even though they're smaller muscle groups, even though it very likely might take more work for certain people to get those lifts to move. So it's not entirely surprising that many people are experiencing that squats and deadlifts are going gangbusters and their bench, their pressing in general is lagging a little bit. The solution to that, if that's the case, it's just going to be more. And that's the hallmark of this program. This program, it's, it's doing more. It's uh, more work. It's increasing the amount of work week to week while engaging in progressive overload, while planning resets so it's sustainable. And all of this should lead, especially if you're in a calorie surplus, should lead to more tissue growth, more size, more strength. And by the time you get into that peak phase, you're just going to be ready to hit PR after PR and expose yourself to loads you've just never experienced before. Now, this one's a 24 week review. This person went through the entire base and peak phase outlined in base strength. This person body weight started at 105, went to 110. So that's 231 to 242. So 11 pounds of body mass. There's a theme. 11 pounds of body mass is not insane. Don't worry. You're not going to accidentally trip into being a 300 pound bodybuilder. If you're 5'10", a lot of the people I deal with that are the source of most of my frustration are 5'10", 180-ish pounds, and terrified to gain any weight. The thing is, muscle gain and strength gain is not linear. It's a very hard, very punctuated process, whereas fat loss is very linear. So when you get to the point where you are a little fluffy after you've put some size on, if you've gained an extra three or four pounds of body fat, that's like five or six weeks to get it off. And once you start eating like regular again, you can start growing. Uh, that is where your head should be. You should be prioritizing size and strength. Doesn't mean eat like a fat shit, but make sure you're eating enough. Allow yourself over 12 weeks to gain five pounds. That's not unreasonable. Squatting 150 training max, so 330 to 440, 110 pound jump. Now, obviously that's a tested max versus kind of a watered down training max in the beginning, but still you're looking at a very sizable increase in strength. Deadlift, 66 pound increase, 170 to 200 kilos. Uh, pause bench went up 33 pounds. It's a pretty sizable jump. Strict press went up uh, 80 kilograms for a single to 90 kilograms for three, 22 pounds and two more reps. So that's a, a pretty impressive jump. Now it's really rewarding to have people follow something you put out and do it with success, but credit has to be given to where it's due. I can only do so much in giving a broad population of people a training split that's going to work for as many of them as possible. The individuals are on the hook for putting in the work, for showing up every day, for appropriately making weight selection, for appropriately making decisions if they run into a wall, and for working harder and harder each week so that they can accumulate all of this growth. It's not easy stuff. So all of the credit should go to the people that ran this, that did it well, that made good decisions. Now you can put any program together, give it to a thousand people, you're going to have at least four or five people that do so well on it, they'd be inclined to write a glowing review. And it might be other factors. So this is by no means a uh, scientific verification that Bull Mastiff is superior to other programs. It is a program. And I will repeat, it is one that is meant to be tweaked to accommodate you and your specific needs. If I'm going to pinpoint why I think it has worked so well for so many people, it's because I think most people who are involved in strength sports in the last few decades have been influenced to do more specialized work to follow what more advanced lifters do, and they skip out on a lot of foundational base building. And this is actually what caused me to write base strength in the first place. It was that people, teenagers, people in their 20s, people with only a few years of training, trying to use exotic variations for barbell movements, people that barely have the skill of being able to squat or deadlift efficiently, they're using reverse bands and they're using uh, specialty bars. And they're doing all kinds of weird grip and tempo changes. And they're trying programs that have so many moving pieces that aren't warranted because they haven't gotten to the point where they need that trickery to keep growing. So taking people back to basics, doing a wide variety of exercises, seeking well-rounded development, prioritizing the amount of work in addition to general progressive overload, and just prioritizing good practice with movements that for over a hundred years have been known to be unbeatable as developmental tools. That's really all you need. So I'm very proud of this as a program and I'm pleased with the way that it's turned out. And I would like more people running it, more people giving me feedback because I do plan on taking this, uh, doing a much more 
fully fleshed out uh, Bull Mastiff program book. I did do a lot with it in peak strength, but I do plan on doing a focus book dedicated towards Bull Mastiff covering all of the variations, the way like in 531, Wendler breaks down all the different variations, the ways you could change the split, the frequency, incorporate different exercises, what to do when you get stuck. There's a lot of stuff I could potentially flesh out because I really think the framework of Bull Mastiff is appropriate and does work very well for a big chunk of the population. Doesn't mean it's appropriate for everybody. It's up to you to figure out what is needed in your program and to adjust accordingly but I am happy with the way it's gone uh, so far. So what I actually wanted to do is make it available to everybody. So I took the 13 page excerpt of the update to Bull Mastiff that's in peak strength, which is a follow-up to base strength, 13 pages. I took it, put it in a PDF and I made it available to everybody. So go ahead and click on the link below. It will redirect you to a page where you can download that in addition to other slides. And you can actually check back to that page in the future because this is where I'm going to update uh, slides and PDFs that I give away for free. I plan on putting out a lot more of these. Also on the chopping block is the foil to this, the counter to the one lift per day, high frequency. That's actually what I'm doing right now. I've had immense success in the past with this style of training. Right now, I'm doing a very high frequency approach, which is new, but I'm already getting a feel for it. I'm already starting to grow. And I do want to dig more into that and I want to capture those of you who would be better off with something that features more touches while you're fresh, as opposed to cramming in a bunch of work to fewer days per week. So there's going to be something for everybody. Strength is accessible to everybody. There's no reason you can't see the growth you want to see. There's no reason you can't eventually grind out competitive numbers. It's just a matter of taking notes and pivoting as needed. So hopefully you took something away from this. So thanks so much for your support. If you read through this 13 page excerpt that covers bull massive from top to bottom. And if you like what you read, consider getting base strength or peak strength. I also have superior deadlift up and I also have more books coming down the pipeline. So I appreciate your support. It's available on my website, empirebarbellstore.com or on amazon.com if you do have a Kindle. Also check out the base strength forum on Facebook. It is absolutely free. We got 1100 people there. Uh, and I dare say most of them are very intelligent, competent lifters. It's not the shit show that most lifting forums are. I'm very pleased with the community that's uh, been built there. And there's a lot of people that I'm happy to have speak for me if you have a question. And I also have a Patreon you can check out. That's where I upload super cuts of my training. I film everything throughout the week. I put it in a cut. I comment on it. That is exclusive to Patreon members. I also take a lot of Q and A's from there. Uh, a lot of direct interaction goes on on Patreon. So if you want to get a little bit closer to me, uh, if you have a run of questions or if you want to provide some topics or questions for future videos and podcast episodes, go ahead and check out Patreon. It is the cheapest, easiest way to get directly in contact with me. Thank you so much, guys, for your support. Your support allows me to do this full time, and I am grateful for the opportunity. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see ya.